Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media and the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment, let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. My name is Abraham Hamilton III. Thank you for tuning into the program. We have J Mac on tap. Not on tap, but in studio. <laughs> and we're ready to rock and roll with today's edition of the program. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are making your transition from your part-time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs where you cultivate an outcome. And having uh, just returned from uh, this weekend, uh, first and foremost, I hope that you um, had a wonderful time joining the Lord's body for worship. Um, I pray that it was um, impactful and instructive, and that in this uh, increasingly evident, evidential, uh, with increasing evidence, the time period reveals that it seems like we're closer, I'll, I'll say it this way, we are closer now than we were yesterday to the Lord's return. I'll say it that way. I think that's the best way to go about saying it. With all of the events that are swirling around us, uh, they affirm the reality that the Bible is true, that the Bible is true at all points. And so uh, as you transition now uh, to your full-time jobs, I want to encourage you to do so with intentionality and with understanding uh, concerning the context that God has given you the privilege to serve him in and through. Um, that context, uh, being members of families, However your family looks, you know, the Lord knows all of the right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That, that could be taken the wrong way. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. God ordained the marital institution as the fulcrum of the family. God's design for marriage and his definition of it exclusively includes one man and one woman and lifelong committed relationship with the capacity to bear offspring. All right. So when I say however your family looks, I'm not making any uh, room for the... Uh, honestly, the perversions of God's institution, of his design for the family. Uh, but understanding that we live in a fallen world, that there are evidences of brokenness all around us. You know, there's an overwhelming proliferation of single parent families, um, an overwhelming proliferation of all manner of things that transpire. Uh, but none of those things are sufficient to cause us to adjust our submission to God's holy, and righteous standard. And so within your familial context, we have some, we have some who listen to us uh, who are widows. You know, we have some who are widowers. Of various contexts, some of you are what's commonly described as empty nesters. Uh, some of you are like me with young children in the home. Uh, whatever, that's what I'm talking about when I say whatever your family looks like. Uh, but God has given you the blessing of that particular context to glorify him and to discharge your faithfulness to him in obedience. And so as you are listening to me and transitioning to your full-time jobs where you're cultivating, cultivating an outcome, it's important that you do so with the understanding that God has provided for us in his word concerning family. The first human institution that he established was the family with marriage at the center. The first command that God gave to mankind was within the familial context. Before you get to a monarch, the order of monarchs, before you get to the modern iterations of civil government, before you get to the orders of priests, the Lord establishes the family first. There's a reason for that. The unfortunate reality is that the world has been far more um, intentional, by and large, not Everyone, there are exceptions to this, but by and large, the world has been far more intentional about establishing, you know, a systematized theology, <laughs> creating a worldview formation. You know, I, I've shared with you all before how Justice Stephen Breyer in the Carson versus Macon, a Supreme Court decision, 
where uh, the Christian schools in Maine, Bangor Christian School and Temple Academy, uh, was excluded from the state's, basically its voucher program because they happened to be a religious, religious Christian schools who taught consistent with their faith. Isn't that amazing? And Justice, Justice Stephen Breyer said the, the quiet part out loud. He said, man, the reason why we believe in providing funding for public schools and excluding Christian schools that are faithful to teaching Christian doctrine, I'm paraphrasing and summarizing what he said, but in his dissent in that case, he literally said, because the public schools we fund are the principal mechanism for creating the value system that ensures our democracy. <laughs> The principal mechanism for transmitting was the exact word to use. Transmitting the value system to ensure our democracy. Say so you thought they were reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's what they were teaching when you didn't realize it was a values transmission system. Yeah. And so they want a values transmission system that excludes the knowledge of God. That excludes God. But the Lord established a family. He never gave authority over the children to the government schools. He never gave authority over the children to, you know, the children's ministry or to the youth pastor. The family is God's mechanism, primary mechanism for accomplishing multi-generational witness, for evangelizing and catechizing and making disciples. And as, as I've said and I will continue to say, the scriptures reveal None of us can guarantee what will happen with our offspring, but what God requires of us is faithfulness. Will we obey what he requires of us concerning his heritage that he entrusts in our care for a season? Will we be faithful to obey him? This is what concerns us. Now, here we are today on the September 11th, 2023. Um, this day, 22 years ago, life in America changed forever. And just uh, praying about and thinking about those events really has moved me uh, for today's program. So I'm going to spend some time talking about that uh, because I believe it's, appro it's appropriate to reflect on what has happened in our nation and to examine what has happened in our nation in light of scripture, and as we examine what has happened in our nation, we examine what's happened in our hearts. So we're going to begin in the word of God, Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 is where I want to begin the program today. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And the word of God says this, the iniquities, the iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. And he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. I read that again. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. And he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. The notion that I want to present to you during today's program is articulated here in scriptures, the iniquity of the wicked, the iniquities of the wicked ensnare, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. The proverb writer is creating a picture for us to examine that is iniquity. It is sinfulness at its onset, at its, at its, at its genesis that ultimately results in the participant and the perpetrator of this iniquity being ensnared. What begins at a dalliance level, what begins with an introductory um, appeal, what begins you know, with a tease, so to speak, culminates in being ensnared. And then that ensnaring then burgeons even the more to being held fast in the cords. It's explaining the process towards bondage. In another place in Scripture, the proverb writer describes sin as growing as a man travels, you know, one step at a time. 
I, I am saying this with you to communicate the biblical truth that sin must be confronted, confessed, repented of, and overcome. You don't age out of sinfulness. You never get to the place where, well, I'm too old for that sin. <laughs> you know. I can tell you I know men who were ensnared in pornography as boys. And I've met 60, 70-year-old men who struggle with pornography. I'm just telling you the truth. They didn't age out of it. What began with an introduction resulted in an, in an ensnaring and burgeoned into full-blown bondage, cords that bind. I also know people who have been set free, specifically since I raised the issue of pornography. I know men who have been delivered from pornography. People who've been delivered from all manner of sin. But the sin had to be confronted, confessed, repented from, and overcome. To say it more simply, the enemy had to be conquered. He didn't just go away. The enemy, it didn't just go away. The giants that we fail to face will reoccur. And often that reoccurrence is in a more vociferous fashion than the initial introduction. If God has revealed areas of your life and, and my life, and again, I'm not, I'm not standing on a soapbox wagging a long pointed finger at you. I am speaking to you as a brother who is endeavoring to yield to the exact same admonition I am offering to you. Don't leave any place for the devil in your own lives. Don't leave any place for the devil. Sometimes when we have, you know, the pet sins, the sins that we become accustomed to living with because they've been around so long. They've been a part of us for so long. And, and they've conditioned us to accommodate their presence. I want to encourage you to ask the Lord afresh, to invite the Lord anew to set you free. Some of what is going to be required in order for you to walk out the liberty that God provides for you is for you, to for you if you're a man, to find a mature brother in the faith whom you can confide in, in whom you can confess your sin to. And I know when a lot of times this is difficult for men. And I think part of it is the way that God has made us because he's made us to be, you know, uh, mountain climbers and, you know, to be dragon slayers. That when it comes to confronting sin personally, we kind of go it alone and neglect the grace of, and the resource that God has given us through his body. But there's a reason why the Bible says a brother is born for adversity. If you're a sister, find a godly, mature woman in the faith. Because often what is necessary for being liberated is confession horizontally. And that confession horizontally creates a foundation for a specific relationship where you have a brother, if you're a man or a sister, if you're a woman, who will walk with you in liberty, into liberty, to be an accountability source for you. Because there are aspects of our inheritance as Christ followers that are reserved for the eternal state. But there are also aspects that are required for us in the here and now. The putting off of the old man and putting on the new is something that we engage in on this side of eternity. 
The world around us is constantly challenging the way we think. That's why we need a constant source of information that's based on the unchanging Word of God. I'm Jeff Shambly, and I invite you to join me for The Stand Radio, a weekly program that highlights the latest trends in culture, faith, and family. You'll hear insightful interviews with a biblical worldview application. The Stand Radio, Saturdays at 4 p.m. and Sundays at 8 p.m. Central on American Family Radio. Whether it's a story about prayer in public schools or battles for biblical truth within our denominations, the American Family News Network is here to tell you what the newsmakers are saying. We are starting to see a rebellion against corporate America's endorsement coddling of the LGBTQ agenda. The American Family News Network is comprised of news anchors and editors that team up to bring you news from a Christian perspective. A TRO for non-legal types out there uh, is basically just an emergency order that would have allowed Liam to go back to school wearing the t-shirt he wants to wear. And again, that t-shirt says there are two genders. Not only can you listen to reports on the radio, but you can also visit AFN.net for coverage of the latest headlines. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis out on the campaign trail was ready with an answer on the meaning of the word woke. American Family News, reporters you can trust. My wife, Jan, played in the marching band in high school and then in college. They all had matching uniforms, but when they played the music, nobody played exactly the same thing. As believers, unity of the faith, we're not the same. Uh, we're different. We have different parts to play, mm. but there can be unity as we play our part in Christ Jesus. Exploring the Word, weekday afternoons at 3 Central on American Family Radio. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner, Abraham Hamilton III. Uh, I want to remind you, September 22nd and 23rd, I will be joining the New Life Church in Nashville, Arkansas. If you are in the area or willing to come to the area, I would love to meet you. Love to hug your neck, make your acquaintance. Uh, It's going to be an amazing time. Uh, New Life Church is hosting the Restoring Truth Conference, and they've invited me, uh, by God's grace, uh, to minister there at their conference. And so I'm looking forward to it uh, tremendously. All right. Uh, September 11th, 2023 is where we are today. And 22 years ago, um, I remember exactly uh, where I was. I was. I was... At ORU in the Michael Cardone uh, dorm lobby. I was in college. And uh, we had the, the, the dorm lobby is actually a, a lobby that connects four dorm rooms, two men's dorms and two women's dorms. Because in our school, men and women don't, there were no co-ed dorms, you see. <laughs> um, and it was called the fishbowl because the lobby was encased with, enclosed with glass. And we had a big screen TV in the lobby. And I remember seeing a bunch of people huddled around the TV, and and I saw, um, the the plane, the second plane crash into uh, the tower in New York City. And I'm bringing this to your attention for a host of reasons. One, to highlight really as a memorial the three thousand some odd Americans who were murdered that day um, as a result of this terrorist attack. And I will never forget um, September 12th, 2001. Some of you may recall in the days and weeks that followed, churches in our country were filled. Unity amongst Americans was palpable for a brief moment. Well, I won't even say it as brief yet, but for a moment, this tragedy had forged a unity that I had not seen prior to that moment. 
and the perception of our nation being, you know, impregnable, you know, was removed from us. Some of you remember, some of my our younger listeners, you have no frame of reference for this, but some of you remember up until September 11, 2011, I'm sorry, 2001, when you went to the airport, you could go with your loved one all the way to the gate, wait with them at the gate. There were no uh, metal detectors and security. The, the concept of going through security to get on the plane didn't even exist. You know, some of you may remember that the se- September 11th attacks are what led to the formation of the Department of Homeland Security. There was no Department of Homeland Security before then. But I remember more than, well, not more than, but the most enduring memory I have from the time period thereafter was people were keenly aware of their frailty, of our frailty as human beings and our need for protection and provision outside of ourselves. So people were turning to God in droves. But what invariably occurred, because just to be plain, the thing that drove people to become God conscious, I'll say it that way, because I'm not saying people were converted into Christianity, born again, even though I know some were, but I'm not saying by and large the entire nation was born again. But I'm saying that we turned to a God consciousness that I had not seen in my lifetime up until that point. But then what happened? Because fear is a motivator to provoke God consciousness, but it is not an enduring motivator if the stimulus that provoked the fear wanes. So things went on, you know, the proverbial war on terror took place and or was instituted and... We as Americans slowly but surely returned to a position to where other things became more important than the previously garnered God consciousness. And the temporary penchant to recognize a a sinfulness that had uh, really brought havoc upon our body politic in America, it began to drift and it began to wane. And we got back to hustling, making money and, you know, consuming luxury and, you know, dining out became, you know, all of these things reasserted themselves. And I began the program as I did because with all of the things that are happening around us, you know, the, the corruption in the government, you know, when you stop and consider that (laughs) Anthony Blinken, the current secretary of state who at the time worked for the Joseph Robinette election campaign in 2020. And when the New York post broke its story concerning Hunter Biden's laptop, Anthony Blinken reaches out to former CIA director Morell and recruits him for help in responding to what they knew immediately was a true story with creating a lying narrative to help them stem the tide of the consequences of the story on the body politic. I've shared with you how Democrat voters who even voted for Mr. Biden in 2020, who said, had I known about this laptop before I voted in 2020, I wouldn't have voted for Joe Biden. So they knew what was going to happen. And so they literally manufactured a lie. Then Morrell goes and recruits other CIA personnel, including three uh, former CIA directors like himself. (laughs) And they literally make up a lie and say, oh, this has all the hallmarks of this information. When you stop and consider, (laughs) you know, the Department of Justice was weaponized against former President Trump under the guise of election interference. Only to realize the Biden campaign participated in election interference to take 
cogent, truthful evidence that they knew was true from the very beginning. And to interfere in the election by intercepting the American people's ability to become apprised of that evidence. Because on October 19th, these intelligence officials came out with their publicized letter, October 27th, October 22nd, Mr. Robinette, in the debate, says, oh, anything concerning this laptop, we have over 51 intelligence officials who say this has all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. Now, this, the whole Russian disinformation claim, you got to remember the context that that was offered in. It's within the context <laughs> of this investigation of Russian disinformation concerning Trump from 2016. So that had, they had lots of Americans who were predisposed to embrace that lie. And it was just a flat out lie. When you see evidence of that kind of corruption and you you see things like medical professionals literally saying things like, yeah, we need to let children decide what they are. Like, what? And and you're offering that as a part of your, you know, Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. This, this is this is what we're doing. This, this is what we're doing. When you you literally have the reality of Anthony Frauci, the wee little leprechaun, who is behind the scenes emailing colleagues, ah, this schmo with this ain't, this don't look natural. And then coming out public and say, oh, yeah, this has natural origins. And then you see the entire U.S. economy shut down because of that, that these dudes knew was a lie from the very beginning. You come to find out that Fauci, the reason why he knows it's not natural in origin, because he's funding gain-of-function research. You learn all of these things, and it reveals that's something else that's afoot here. Th- these are the type, types of things that drove Tucker Carlson to conclude, nah, this is not normal. There are external forces involved here. My hope for today's program is to underscore for you in a way that resonates that brothers and sisters Flesh and blood is not merely our opponent. There is wickedness in high places that is afoot here. And my challenge to you and my encouragement is for you not to become conveniently ignorant of that fact and live as if you are ignorant of that fact. Being a um, professing Christian while lifestyle evidence is practical atheism. You live as if there is no God. And that all of these macro level issues help to point you, just like I'm endeavoring to point myself to the plague of my own heart. That I don't, I don't become casual about my commitment to walking upright in holiness before God. That I don't allow the things that are discussed at a national or on a global scale to manipulate me away from. responding in where I have authority, in a jurisdiction where I have control, where I don't live as a man of God personally. I want to point you to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Because again, as the proverb writer says, sin grows as a man travels. Proverbs 5.22, iniquity ensnares. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, and again, we have to remember this context. Moses is preparing to be off the scene. The second generation Israelites are about to enter the promised land. The first generation of Israelites, all who are 20 years old and up, except for Joshua and Caleb, all passed away in the wilderness. And the second generation is about to enter the promised land. And Moses is recounting for them a second telling, deuter, meaning two. A second telling, recounting for them all that is necessary for them to not only enter the promised land, but to thrive. And he says something specifically about kings in Deuteronomy chapter 17. I'm going to read this. Verses 14 through 20. Listen to what the word of God says. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, 
I would set a king over me, or if you're from the, the south side of Israel, you might say, I might set a king over me. That's a joke. <laughs> I would set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Side note, at the original Constitutional Convention, this scripture is the one that led our founders to require all American presidents to be natural-born citizens of the United States of America. The primary authoritative source for that requirement for, for presidential candidates comes right out of the scripture. Let me keep going. I'll read verse 15 again, the latter part. When you set, get a king, he must be from among your brothers. You shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Verse 16, only, only he, the king, must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. Isn't it amazing when Solomon comes to the throne? What is one of the first things he does? I know we know a lot about, you know, him with foreign women. But one of the first things that Solomon does is that he acquires many horses. And he sends emissaries to Egypt to get more horses for him. Isn't that interesting? Let's keep going. Rebellion straight out of the gate. Solomon is the third king of the nation of Israel. The third king of the nation of Israel directly defies the instructions that God has given to his people. Verse 17, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself. Lest his heart turn away. Solomon, anyone? Got the horses? Got the horses in the back. <laughs> and the front. And acquire many wives. Nor shall he acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Look at verse 18. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the, Levit the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Among the things that God required of Israelite kings is that each king was to make his own hand copy of the book of the law. Hand copy. Each king was supposed to copy the book of the law for himself. And he was to keep it and read it all the days of his life. This wasn't a suggestion from, you know, Cousin Pookie. This is what God required of Israelite kings. But you'll see, sin grows as a man travels. Sometimes shortcuts are not wise. If that's true physically, how true that might be spiritually. I think all of us have shortcut stories, you know? <laughs> yeah. But there are some you don't want a shortcut when it comes to getting to God, do you? There is no shortcut to God. It's only through Jesus. Exploring Missions with Bert and Nathan Harper. Saturday afternoons at 2.30 Central and Sundays at 1 Central on American Family Radio. Little did you know that the same legal terminology, the same legal terms that we use today, uh, Probable cause, just cause, there's multiple ways to describe it, but David uses that same terminology. How do we know what's just? Well, we know what's just by looking at God's Word. That's where we get our ultimate definition of justice from. 
AFA at the Core with Walker Wildman. Weekday afternoons at 1 Central on American Family Radio. Some guy who claims to be a girl is not science. I'm sorry. You no, did, it's not. You just can't claim to be something that you're not. No, we don't allow people to choose their ethnicity. No. Or their age. No, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm an Eskimo, so provide me with a free igloo. We don't, don't let people do that. We don't. You're a male, and you can't claim to be a female, because you're not. Today's Issues, weekday mornings at 11 Eastern and 10 Central on American Family Radio. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. September 11, 2001. September 12, 2001. In the days following, the American people were palpably jolted into God consciousness. But then as the days and the weeks went on, what happened? We've drifted. We've drifted down from September 12th, 2001 to where the God consciousness was palpable to the Democrat Party booing God at their convention (laughs) to Barack Hussein Obama lighting up the White House in rainbow colors to celebrate perversion, to celebrate what God says he resists, the proud. Barack Hussein and Joseph Robinette taking laps around the White House, running, celebrating. Isn't it interesting now we find out young Barack was sending love letters to his girlfriend. Talking about how he fantasized. (laughs) He fantasized about what he later on in the White House celebrated by lighting up the White House in rainbow colors. Isn't that interesting? We've had people... Uh, no longer blushing about this. And, but we want to get to national political conv- conventions and shout, shout your abortion, shout your willingness to kill a, a small, dependent, innocent image bearer. We've gone to where greed is good. You know, Wolf of Wall Street played out in Main Street in America. Covetousness. Normalized. Instead of loving our neighbors, man, rank hatred for our neighbors. Though the Lord reveals in Scripture from one blood he created all mankind, the world has been effective in dividing, balkanizing our society amongst several different trajectory lines, but especially according to skin color. How did we get here? I'll tell you. One step at a time. Before the break, I read the scripture for you. That the Lord required of Israelite kings. And and remember in Deuteronomy, this is before there was ever any king. This is way before there was a king Saul. But the Lord says, yeah, there'll be a king. But I'm requiring the king to have his own copy of the book of the law that he hand copies. And he said that oversaw, supervised by the priests. The Levites had the God ordained mandate of overseeing the monarchical copying of the book of the law and keeping it with him. How did we get here? How did Judah get to, how did Israel, and then later how did Judah get to 2 Kings chapter 22? Verses 8 through 13. What happens there? Josiah becomes king of the now divided kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah. The people of Israel have drifted to such a degree. The name of these people reveals their connection, their relationship to God. The name Israel depicts them being the people of God. But then we have second Kings 22, verses 8 through 13. What does it say? Verse 8, And Hilkiah, the high priest, high priest, said to Shaphan, 
the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. See, I have to un- step back a bit. The Lord instituted the, tabern- the tabernacle under Moses. The tabernacle becomes a temple designed by God, conveyed to David, constructed ultimately by Solomon. At the time that Josiah becomes king of the now divided southern kingdom of Judah. The temple that was supposed to be the fulcrum of Israelite life, the center of Israelite life. Had fallen into disrepair. The clear communication from scripture is that the priests really weren't priesting anymore. Because the only way that the temple could fall into disrepair is if the people begin to neglect the temple and the priests are no longer day and night, night and day, let incense. No, the incense ain't rising. Day and night, night and day. The candelabra is not being illuminated. The showbread ain't showing. And the temple had fallen into such a disrepair, Josiah began a restoration campaign. Mostly ceremonial initially. And then we come to verse 8. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. That's for the restoration campaign. Verse 10. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the priest, and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Akbor, the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan, the secretary, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book, to do according to all that is written concerning us. From the command in Deuteronomy chapter 17 for the king who would come subsequently to have his own handwritten copy of the book of the law. Things drifted in Israel so badly to where the temple falls into complete disrepair. And King Josiah is astounded to learn that there is a such thing called the book of the law. What happened in Israel? Iniquity ensnared. The ensnaring produced cords of bondage and sin that maintained stricture generationally, that caused the people of God to so redefine and reconstitute themselves away from God that being Israel in Judah meant something entirely different at the time of Josiah than it had meant at God has established. The defining feature of being the people of God was relationship with and submission to the God of the people. But the drift sets in to where the people of God are so estranged from God is supposed to be the God of the people that they are shocked to learn that there's a book of the law. I often point this out when people ask me, Abe, how can modern day Jews be agnostic? (laughs) I point them to this. What do you think the Jews in Josiah's day were? You think they were devoted Yahweh worshipers? Many of them, and notice how Josiah articulated, the Lord's wrath is kindled against us because our fathers haven't obeyed the words of this book. And because generationally our fathers didn't obey, I didn't even know there was a book. 
which is why he was grieved and lamented when he learned as <laughs> Schaefer, the secretary, read to him from it. How do we go from September 11th, 2001 to September 12th with this palpable God consciousness throughout our country to where we are September 11th, 2023? Where we have teachers and school boards. The story I shared a couple weeks ago, the superintendent in California appears at a school board meeting to oppose a policy that will require teachers. If you have a child entertaining some kind of social gender transition at school, the parents have to be notified in three days. And the superintendent shows up not to affirm the policy, but to give a whole speech and a screed as to how that's discriminatory. How do we get here? As a man travels. As I reflect on September 11th, I cannot help but also reflect on September 12th. And as we see in Scripture, the Scripture outlines things for us to inform us, yes. To record history, yes. To give us doctrine, yes. But also give us examples, to give us examples of things that we should emulate as well as things that we should avoid. If we are not intentional about confronting the plague of our own hearts, we can allow that plague to become an internal cultural norm to where we just adjust our lifestyles to accommodate its presence. And then guess what happens generationally? The thorns, or should I say the, 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 the foreign plants that are allowed in daddy's generation, they become full-blown trees in son's generations. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to drift. I don't want to drift. I don't want to just do a show. The Lord has given me the opportunity to have this platform, and I committed to him that I would endeavor to utilize it for his glory, to where I would, I would attempt to present the issues of the day through the lens of Scripture. To where we're not just talking heads, sharing information, but to where there's ultimately a group of people who come together and are encouraged to place our hope and our faith in the Lord continually. It's easy to become consumed and overwhelmed by the proliferation of wickedness in our day. But God didn't plan us here to curse the darkness or to be consumed by the context that he's planted us here, planted us in. He has planted us in this time to be vessels for his glory, to be his ambassadors, to be conduits through whom his appeal is being made. That as the world is going bonkers, that we're able to stand up to those who are suffering from the carnage of the deception that's prevalent in our time. To those who have yielded to the seductive lies of the wicked one, the slithering, talking snake who's manipulated and seduced that young lady into uh, mutilating her body in the name of identity. Only to learn that there's no amount of surgery, there's no amount of pill ingestion, there's no amount of drugs or hormone treatments that can ever change a woman into a man. God planted us here in this time so that we can be there for that woman and to say, there's another way walk you there in. For the men who have been, first of all, the casualties you know, of the sexual revolution and the downstream consequences where we sought to divorce the physical pleasures of intimacy from the God-ordained consequences of it. For our benefit to move people from self-absorbed, self-centered lives to living the embodiment of living one's life in submission to God and for the benefit of those outside of ourselves. The culture says, nah, you don't want that. 
it's only about us. It's all about personal. It's all about what we want. It's all about, you know, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of self-actualization. And when people have bought and consumed those lies and find out that it's empty at the end, that it's vacuous at the end, the man that has bought the lies and it made him think that he was a woman, or the man who bought the lies and thought that being a whoremonger would show that, yeah, I'm a real man, only to also find himself empty. For the people who thought life is all about the paper chase, all about luxury, all about shopping, all about building barns and bigger barns, and when they find at the end of it, it's all vanity. God wants those people, and he plants us as his ambassadors. To where he's able to say, by the love you show, will all men know you're my disciples. That in the carnage that is our current cultural context, God desires a harvest among us. And he could do it however he wants, but he's chosen to use us, his descendants, his disciples, as his hands and feet. Brothers and sisters, let's not be consumed by the context that we're in, but let us shine brightly for the glory of our king within it. <laughs>